you raised millions of dollars for a SPAC. You put that money to work in less than four months. You've told us about a week ago you think that it's the future of the market. However, we already have SPAC volumes ballooning to about half of the record that we saw last year. How could this possibly continue? Well, good to have me on, uh, Schnally. Well, first of all, it, it's really, you have to size it. For, for many decades now, money has been pouring into alternatives. I think there's $4 trillion in private equity, a trillion and a half dollars to be spent. And what have they had all this time? They've had the ability to sit down with a company, look at their projections, get to see what the inside of a company and what their future looks like. By the way, same with late stage working capital, which has diverted uh, many companies from going public. In fact, over the last 20 years, I, I, I think there's 50% less stocks trading publicly than there were 20 years ago as a result of those pools of capital. So with the SPAC market, it's probably up to $350 billion um, today. It's, it's just another pool of capital trying to find great opportunities for high growth companies and getting the benefit of due diligence and meeting with the company in advance. So I think it's very exciting. Well, speaking of due diligence, right, you have Mollison Company, you have a whole slate of bankers. Bring us into the process a little bit here, because if somebody doesn't have that kind of capability, how hard is it to get a deal done? And I know you're looking at another deal right now for your other SPAC, right, Atlas II. Well, I don't know how you know that, but you might have better sources than me, Chanel. You well, you have do. to, right? You have to. <laughs> get the deal done within a, a matter of time? Is it hard to do for just anybody? Well, look, I think it's hard to do good deals. And we, what we're viewing this as is, an, is really an alternative, a parallel to what I consider an old method of going public. I went public, it's coming on six years now, and it took me 12 months. From the time I said to my organization, let's go public, it was a 12 month process. And it was, it was very nerve wracking. You have your whole organization ready to go and you don't know what the outcome is till the final day. Something could happen in the market. The, the brilliance of what's going on with this uh, new method of SPAC is that in a very short period of time, an entrepreneur has certainty. Um, and I, I will tell you, high growth companies, entrepreneurs, certainty and knowledge of where your company's going is very valuable and they're willing to pay for it. And so what we're trying to do we're really trying to find disruptive companies who are alternative really to IPOs. We don't view it as a special purpose acquisition company. It should be named a special purpose IPO vehicle. And I think we're in a wonderful position to assess, we have uh, 900 people around the world, to assess who are the best companies in the world, who are the best partners, do the diligence, introduce them to the best investors in the world. I, I think it's, it's, I'm very excited about what this might lead to for uh, going forward. Well, speaking of introducing people to investors here, one of the things you had mentioned to me was that you did this without a trading floor, right? So what kind of opportunity is there to disrupt the investment banking model, right? IPOs used to be a huge fee engine for the big banks. Well, it's interesting. I always wondered why, uh, in my own uh, amateurish way, why the big auto companies didn't, uh, you know, ultimately they thought they'd come after Tesla. Then it hit me that it is hard to declare carburetors uh, not worth a lot of money if you have a billion dollars of them in inventory. And what I see going on right now is many of the big institutions are stuck with a tremendous investment in tangible trading floors, uh, technology, old technology, and the world is going, I think, is skirting right by it and is finding entrepreneurs and, um, and being able to fund them and access them much quicker and much more capital light. We did this transaction recently where we raised $1.1 billion, probably in an eight to 12, 10 month, 10 week, sorry, period. Um, and you're right, we had no trading floor and we, uh, we did it right here in front of our uh, computers. Well, so that draws the question, how are you going after the bigger banks? You know, I'm not going after the bigger banks. I'm going after our clients. Uh, we have the, the clients these days are not as wrapped up in it. They are over the brand images. Um, they are exciting. I will tell you, just being involved with now with Atlas Crest and seeing the creativity and what's going on in the world, it's really almost a new uh, place for me to see how, how creative and how forward thinking um, people are out there and it's it's fun i can tell you that it is fun to see 
what people are dreaming about and what they want to have happen in the future. So the other thing people are talking about with so many pump, uh, companies going public is where we are in the market cycle. I know you study this very, very closely. Are you worried about the valuations we're, we're sitting at right now? You know, I've been in Wall Street 40 years, and I have to admit I'm worried about valuations probably for 39.9 <laughs> of those years. Um, it's just what we do. And I, look, I think the, the part about being in this is to, is to be stable, is to not get yourself levered. Um, look, the free market economy is incredibly creative. And every time they come up with something new and something interesting and the world moves forward, and the key is to just make sure you and the, and the institution around you is stable. And at Mollison Company, you know, that's why we keep an unlevered balance sheet. We have a lot of excess capital. Look, a lot of, uh, as you call it, our big competitors, even the most solid ones, are levered 10 or 12 to 1. That's just the way a big bank works. And so when things get in trouble, they have to pull back. We, we do the opposite when, when things are bad. We have no leverage and we move forward. I, I like to get aggressive when everybody else is, is moving backward. Ken, whether we're in a bubble or not, whether we're seeing froth or not, um, there is going to come a point in time where this market corrects. What do you think is going to do well when these markets correct? And do you think private assets will outperform? Do you think the mark-to-market... -market issue will actually work in their favor the fact that you don't have to do it in the same way that you have to in public markets will there be an illiquidity premium when we do that have that correction by the way there always is uh people tend to uh when things get uh, uh, pretty bubbly you know they they discount liquidity and liquidity is an asset by the way it's one of the reasons why you're seeing this ipo boom in SPACs. liquidity is a worthwhile thing to have so I agree with uh, liquidity will come to the forum. And, Guy, it'll all come down to leverage. It always does. And so I think there's lots of great ways to put your money to work and to be involved with this market. And I would just discourage people from taking on that marginal bit of risk on leverage. Um, time is your friend here, and leverage is your enemy, And because le leverage is uncontrollable, and leverage comes and, and, and tends to... People want their money back usually at the exact moment you really don't want to give it back to them. So this is a great point because we're reaching record amounts of leverage in corporate America also, Ken. And, you know, you started your career over at Drexel Burnham, so you know a thing or two about leverage and the dangers of it and where it goes from here. Do you have any concerns about, you know, at, at, frankly, corporate and sovereign balance sheets right now? Look, there are some there's some industries that have had to take on leverage in the pandemic just to get through it. I, I think that that's one of the things we're missing here is that, sure, the Fed provided liquidity, but the economy is going to have to come back and, and recalibrate and cover enough cash flow to actually cover leverage that's been taken on to get through this. So I worry a little about that. Um, I don't see uh, leverage throughout the system. Um, again, Warren Buffett always says that when the, when, the, when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. And it does amaze me, by the way, Shanali, at the underlying hidden risks that you find once the tide goes out. And so I, I always wonder what I don't know. I think there, there may be leverage going on behind the scenes that isn't as obvious to all of us as we think. But I, again, my, my comment would be to stay away from that. Hey, Ken, uh, Alex here in New York. Um, so let's like marry a couple of those thoughts. And I'm curious as to the electric aircraft startup uh, Archer, which merged with your blank check uh, company that was backed by you is a big deal, almost $4 billion. And I'm wondering like how you think about this energy transition shift to green, like how much money, how aggressive do you want to be in the space and what are valuations like at this point? That's a great question, especially with what's going on down in the southern part of the country right now. And uh, some of the I you're following some of the ramifications of trying to get technology to do things it's not really capable of doing right now. And I worry a lot about that. Um, when you force the free market to do things that they're not ready to do, it could have terrible consequences. I am I'm very excited about it. We are starting to look at things like and I think the country's ready to take a big leap. Um, I, I really believe energy density is important. I believe that there's going to be a resurgence of nuclear and things that are, are much more baseload uh, positive and energy dense. 
And I do think there's going to be a lot of money made and lost in trying to figure out um, how do we get green and which of those energies of the future. So it's an exciting time. Well, you mentioned what's happening in so much of the country right now and what's happening with the power grids. What are your clients saying? I mean, how big of a deal is this? Well, it was hard, uh, you know, this happened over the weekend, but I, I think it's obvious what happened here. Um, you cannot force a government mandate on certain things that aren't ready to supply the basic uh, needs of people. And, I, you know, I, again, I don't know the total ramifications. I've been worried about uh, my friends down in Houston and in Dallas. They, those are cold temperatures and not and they're not prepared for it and they don't have a, uh, a supplement. So, I, I, you know, I hope everybody's well. But we're going to have to balance the changes we need to decarbonize with the needs of, by the way, the emerging world who still wants energy. I think sometimes we forget that there's an enormous amount of people in the emerging world who need cheap energy to live a life that's equivalent to what we're used to living. Much of America and Europe is used to living with the benefits of accessible energy. When you see what's going on in, uh, in in Texas right now, you realize what the rest of the world goes through when they can't get that cheap and accessible and dependable energy. And I think we have to be very careful of how we dictate this.